distance 27 feet. And uh, are we you okay? Yes, it's just recording. Okay, we are recording this uh, for posterity. Uh, I am Michael Stamikikos, a professor of physics and astronomy at OSU Newark. And I've had the pleasure for the last couple of years working with my colleague, Professor Matthews, who is in the Neuroscience Department at Denison University, and Lucy Chin Parker, who is an administrator here at the Canadian Public Library. And we're bringing you Blowing Off STEAM. STEAM there is, stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Art, and Mathematics. And we do this on the second Tuesday of every month, beginning in September, running through December. I think we take a break in January, and then we go February to May or April. Sounds right. And uh, before I introduce today's speaker, I would like to bring in my partner in crime here, Dr. Nestor Matthews, talk about next month's speaker. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Nestor Matthews. I do teach at Denison University. And I'm excited that next month, we're going to have a Denison University professor whose name is Dr. Drexler James. Dr. James might be joining us this evening, even by Zoom. And his topic is going to be on the social determinants of health. So a little bit biology related and a little bit psychology related. I'm looking forward to next, uh, next month's talk. Back to you. Okay, great, thank you. But today we're here to talk about bees and we're here with an expert in that subject, Professor Karen Goodell from the Department of Evolution, Ecology and Art Organ Organismal Evolution at OSU. She studied biology at Brown University as an undergraduate and then spent a couple of years in the Peace Corps, which is very impressive, volunteering in Costa Rica. And then finally doing a master's in botany at UC Riverside, studying plant population genetics, and then eventually a PhD in ecology and evolution at SUNY Stony Brook, studying uh, pollinators. She conducted her postdoc work in that, uh, in an impact of the base of plants and pollinators, and eventually made her way to OSU in 2004, where she then transitioned to studying native bee populations in agriculture and reclaimed lands in Ohio. And she's currently directing the Ohio Bee Survey to document Ohio native bees. And her topic is ecology and conservation of Ohio's, Ohio bees. And the good news is we brought in some bees earlier and we, we got back almost all of them. Uh, so <laughs> just a little pinch, don't worry about it. And with that, please help me welcome Professor Goodell. Great, well, thank you so much. It's really wonderful to have a, a small live audience and hopefully everybody can hear me on Zoom as well. Yeah. Trying to work out this technology. So I've been working on, on bees for quite a long time. I've studied bee uh, population biology, bee demography, bee community ecology. And recently I have uh, been working on bee habitat, bees in agriculture, and bee surveys. So I'm gonna talk about not all of that, but a couple of those uh, topics, introduce at least a couple of the research projects in my lab. But before I get started, I thought it would be useful to introduce you to the bees. So usually when I ask audiences to name what bees they know, okay, maybe we could try that here. So can anybody name a kind of a bee? Honeybee. Honeybee, yes, that's that's the number one bee, right? Any any other kind of bees? Carpenter. Carpenter bee, excellent. A solitary bee, yes. Any others? Bumblebee. A bumblebee. Great. So those are probably the three uh, most commonly understood bees. So all of you have have one. You already know that there's more than just honeybees. But in fact, how many more? Estimates are, and we are still learning how many uh, by uh, new species are being uh, described constantly, but estimates suggest that there, oops, that's not a pointer, apparently. <laughs> the center, the large center button. Oh, the large center button, yeah. Figures I would miss that. Um, estimates are there about, this says 20,000 is probably more like 22,000 um, species of bees in the world. And uh, of course, not all of those live in the, in, in the Americas. In North America, we probably have about 5,000 species of bees. And in Ohio, we have the diminutive 500 species. But that's still a lot more than three. And it's a <laughs> fair number if you are trying to enumerate them all, which is one of my current projects. And uh, 
you'll notice that I don't have an exact number and that's significant because we really don't know what bees we have currently in Ohio. And unfortunately, we really don't know which ones we had in the past with any accuracy. So here is just a little um, diagram showing you some of the diversity of bees. And because this is a blowing off steam, not a blowing off stem, I have to include artistic things. And there's nothing really more artistic than photographs of bees. So you can see um, everything from this nomia. This is an alkali bee that has these opalescent stripes. This is a, a, a leaf cutter bee artistically rolling a leaf that it will use to make its nest. This is a, a bumblebee, very fuzzy, a stingless bee from the tropics. Uh, this is a parasitic bee that if you saw it, you would probably think it was a wasp. Um, here's a longhorn bee looking very full of pollen on its legs. And these are some of my favorite. Those are squash bees that you really are only gonna find in squash and pumpkin plants. So quite a diversity of bees. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about where bees come from so that you have a full understanding of um, what this group, how biologists think of this group. So what we're looking at here is the evolutionary history of a big group called the, uh, called the Hymenoptera. And along the uh, vertical axis here, we have time with today being uh, at the top. And this big period here is called the Cretaceous, which you might know uh, better as the time when dinosaurs were roaming the earth. At the end of the Cretaceous, the dinosaurs went extinct, as far as we know, except for birds. So you can see the ancestor to all bees shows up about here. And what is interesting to do is sort of um, understand that bees have diversified as indicated by these, um, these nodes splitting into various lineages quite substantially over time, but they go all the way back to the time of the dinosaurs. And significant is this is about the time when flowering plants evolved and started to um, diversify. So evidence suggests that bees with this new habit of um, collecting pollen and nectar and feeding that to their, to their offspring, bees are the original um, vegetarians of the, of the Hymenoptera. They're, their closest relatives, the wasps, fed their larvae on prey. And so bees are completely, I think vegan actually would describe it even better. Um, bees are largely vegan. They, um, they collect pollen and nectar to feed to their larvae and the adults will eat, will eat uh, nectar. And you can see they have various adaptations here that help them to do these things. So this is showing that they have branched hairs. If you look with a microscope at the hairs of a bee, they're gonna look like feathers. If you look with a microscope at the hairs of a wasp, they're gonna look like little hairs, right? No split ends. You can see that those feathery hairs are good for um, embedding pollen grains. And this little thing is showing a little comb. They have little, um, they have adapted little structures all over their bodies to do specialized things like comb pollen out of their fur or clean their antennae off they're kind of like the original Mr. Gadget. Okay, so bees have a long history and they're highly diverse and they fall into a number of, of families and those are shown here that have um, ecological and, and uh, evolutionary differences that go back pretty far in time. They're highly diverse and for a group of organisms that all basically eat pollen and nectar, there's striking differences in things like body size. Body size differences are usually proportional to flight range, so that's an important ecological difference. Uh, what kinds of flowers they eat. Some of them are extremely picky eaters, like the kid that only eats peanut butter sandwiches. Squash bees only eat squash pollen as larvae. They won't eat anything else. They would rather die, and they will if you try to feed them any other pollen. Um, others are highly, uh, highly um, varied in their diets. They have different timing of annual activity. Some come out very early in the spring and are gone by the end of June. 
Some of them last all what all growing season and some only come out at the end of the season. So they have a lot of differences there. They some of them are highly social, like honeybees and bumblebees, and some of them are most of them actually are solitary. They each female makes her own nest, never really aggregates with anybody else. And they nest in very different places. Some nest above ground, a lot of them nest below ground, and in different kinds of substrates. So all of these things make for a very highly diverse group. And when we talk about conservation of bees, you gotta kind of take all these ecological differences into account. So I wanna talk a little bit about, uh, dig in a little bit more about this variation in size. Bees range about an order of magnitude in size, everything from something that's a few millimeters long to something that's uh, you know, 15 to 20 millimeters long in terms of uh, uh, their size, like a queen bumblebee or a big carpenter bee. And with that size difference comes difference in strength, efficiency, and uh, resource needs. So bees are kind of like us. They're central place foragers. All of you are central place foragers. You have a house. And from that house, you go out and you get your food, and then you come back and keep it at your house. You have your family at your house. Bees do the same thing. And this is quite unlike other pollinators like flies and butterflies. They just flit around and lay their eggs forever, right? So bees make a nest. And that means that all of the resources that a bee needs to complete its life cycle need to be within its flight range of that nest. All the flowers, all the pollen and nectar, all the nesting resources, the nesting habitat itself, all need to be within that circle. And that circle is going to be a very different size if you are three millimeters long than if you are 20 millimeters long. And in fact, bees that are small, which is again, the majority of bees, have a flight range that's in the hundreds of meters. Some studies suggest that they really only fly about 200 meters maximum from their nest. That means everything they need to complete their life cycle has to be in that area. So that has very big implications for how we think about habitat. Now, why do we care so much about bees? And many times I, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir because bees have gotten a lot of attention in the past couple of decades. But I'm gonna repeat these things anyway. About 90% of plants benefit to some degree at least from pollination by insects. And about 75% of plants really need insect pollination to complete their life cycles. And that includes crop plants. About 33% of crop production um, is, um, comes to us through bees. So bees transfer pollen from male parts of the plant to female parts of the plant and allow seeds and fruits to be made. So without bees, we would lose about 33% of crop production. We would still have things that are wind pollinated like corn and wheat. Many of our staple crops, some of these big commodities probably wouldn't suffer that much. However, many of the crops that give us a lot of vitamins and add variety to our diet, those would all go away. So this is just a very small, oops, small list, sorry. Figure out which way is backwards. There we go. There right, we go. This is a very small list of crops that are important in Ohio that we would not have without bees. Things like apples, peaches, plums, all of the stone fruits, cucumbers, pumpkins, and squash, and so forth. All of our nuts, those are really dependent on bees but also wild plants depend on pollinators. And when these plants don't get adequate pollination, they don't succeed. So one of my students studied this beautiful little spring ephemeral, uh, Dicentra uh, canadensis, it's called squirrel corn. It's actually self incompatible. It cannot mate with itself or a relative. And it absolutely requires a bee, usually a queen bumblebee because of the time it flowers, to visit this plant and then go visit another plant at some distance. And 
B declines are going to have a very big impact on these populations. In terms of crop plants, this is what you might get in a strawberry patch that was poorly pollinated. If you ever go to the farmer's market and you see this, you know that that farm probably has inadequate pollination. Cucumbers that look like this, also you can see it's not fully developed on one end. That's a result of inadequate pollination. Here's that same issue in pears. You can see this pear, part of it didn't develop, probably because it didn't get adequate pollination. So that whole side of the pear is, uh, wasn't stimulated to produce fruit. Some places, uh, the environment has been so damaged by things like pesticides that there really is not even uh, any pollinators to do the work. This is an apple orchard in China, part of China where they cannot sustain bees. There's too many pesticides in the water and the soil and people are doing the job of bees. And that is just incredible to me. That, that is a job that people should not have to do. So declines in bee popula populations are jeopardizing crops. Um, and natural plant populations. And that includes honeybees. We hear a lot of attention about that, but wild bees also are, are in serious decline as well. So some of the threats to bees um, are um, loss of habitat uh, or alterations in habitat that limit the amount of flowers that they have to eat or the, the variety of flowers. Um, pesticides, there are a lot of different pesticides that we are using that are damaging to bees in many different ways and sometimes in kind of insidious ways. And one of the things that is becoming very clear to us is that pesticides have impacts on bees. Things that you might have heard of neonicotinoids, these are pesticides that mimic the uh, neurotransmitters of some insects and they kind of can use bees, but it's very difficult to demonstrate that neonicotinoids kill bees. However, what we're learning is that they interact with fungicides um, to make bees more susceptible to pathogens, internal pathogens, um, and pyrethroids as well, another big class of, um, of chemicals that are put onto crops and pesticides also interact with fungicides. Fungicides aren't even, aren't even uh, insecticides. They are supposed to be killing fungi. Nevertheless, through their interactions with other chemicals can reduce these uh, immune systems enough to make them you know, very susceptible to pathogens that otherwise also wouldn't kill them. So these interactions um, that are largely put forth by humans are extremely important in bees. So this is from a, a review by Dave Coulson, who's a a British uh, bee researcher. So habitat for bees needs to consider some of these things. It needs to consider uh, flowers. You need to have a lot of flowers. You need to have uh, cozy overwintering spots. You need to have nest sites in soil and wood in um, abandoned beetle burrows and abandoned rodent nests. All of these are going to contribute to at least some uh, bee population. And then we need to think about having these things all in a small enough area that the bees that we're interested in serving can use them. So I was interested a number of years ago in thinking about, you know, what kinds of habitats in Ohio might we have an abundance of that could be improved for, for bee and pollinator conservation. And uh, the, the reclaimed mines, especially um, some out uh, in eastern, southeastern Ohio, came to my attention. These are areas that have been surface mined for coal and then reclaimed in a variety of ways, but usually with exotic grasses. And so they don't represent particularly good habitat for bees. And you can see there's one here. Um, I wondered if we enhance the flower plantings on these reclaimed mines, if that would have an impact on bees. And I was interested a little bit in how the details of that kind of uh, habitat enhancement might play out. So I messed around with what kind of flowers uh, could be planted and where on the landscape you might put these. So this was kind of a, um, an interesting site. 
This site uh, is out of the wilds. It's got a, a nice little forest here that was never mined. It's got a big reclaimed grassland. And that grassland, especially out here, is very distant from the forest. So it's pretty far away from any real uh, habitat that might be a source habitat for, for certain kinds of organisms. So I wondered what plants I could plant and what spatial scales, you know, where along this landscape would be good to plant. And this is sort of what I did. I, I created lots of little spots. And if you look very closely, I don't know if this would show up on Zoom or not, but you can see little circles here with little paths between them. There's another one out here. And there's a bunch of them. There's one right there. I'm, I created 48 plots that are 20 meters in diameter. So they're almost you know, about the size of this room, really circular plots, because that was what was easy. And I dotted these across the landscape along a gradient from close to the forest and the whole line of them that go about here, close to a, a little prairie patch that had been previously planted, and then way out here to these grasslands. And I wondered how these would um, encounter these and use them for habitat. And this is just what one of them looks like. This one was looked at the top right there. These were uh, done out of the wilds. The wilds, if you haven't been there, is a very interesting place where they do um, conservation, uh, conservation work. It's out near Zanesville. It is about 10,000 acres of reclaimed strip mine that uh, the mining ended in about 1987, and since then it has been reclaimed. Some of the reclamations has then subsequently been converted into native prairie, but those are fairly small patches. It's also run now by the zoo, and they do some research and tourism with uh, exotic megafauna. So that's another benefit of working there, so I get to go on safari every single day. <laughs> But this is more like what my work was. I tried to avoid most of the large animals. And we created these 48 experimental prairie plots. This is at the very outset what they look like. This is a, a picture that shows the forest and that lake that I showed you an aerial image of. And all these dots are my different plots. They were 20 meters in diameter. Uh, there are three different treatments of, of seed mixes that I use. And mostly I use native prairie seed. And again, I was really interested in these gradient. So close to the forest, far from the forest. This little area up here was a, a prairie. So I thought maybe pollinators might be more abundant and, and diverse right up here by the prairie as well. And this is what that looked like. That's May year one, July of year one. And you can see I was pretty successful getting a lot of vegetation in year two there. There's me and uh, sampling with my net. So we kept track of what pollinators were there, what flowers were there. In fact, I'm just publishing a 10 year um, time series on these plots of all the sort of from the pollinator perspective, what, what flowers are in these plots and how they lasted over the years. So that um, I'm very uh, pleased about with a couple of colleagues in the grad student that papers should be coming out soon. But I think one of the most exciting things I found, I found within the first couple of years, after closely monitoring uh, bees in these plots, <clears throat> the number of bee species that was, uh, that I found in areas close to the forest was a lot higher than the number that I found far away from the forest. And that is a pretty, actually a pretty small um, distance. So it's 400 meters with my furthest plots. Some of these plots have 100 bee species, and I, I realize I didn't leave the scale up here, but it's 100 is the top. So almost 100 bee species, actually 120 I might be the top. So this one I think was 100 bee species or 102 or something. So plots close to the forest had a lot more species of bees. If I plot the number of bees I found, I get a very similar diagram. I'm not going to show too many graphs, but I think this one is very illustrative of some very interesting ecological patterns. So what is going on here? And uh, after a little bit more scrambling around for funding, I decided what I really needed to do was dig into this trend and think about what it is about forest that is so important for bees. 
if you go into the forest in the spring, there's a lot of flowers. If you are uh, interested in flowers, you'll notice all the spring ephemerals in the forest. But you know, later in the season, there's really not a lot going on for bees in the forest. Most of the action in terms of food is going to be out in the grasslands. So why is it that forests play such a big role? Now, certainly many of these are some of the spring species that I just didn't get out in the grasslands because they're more forest species. <coughs> but I think that the lack of trees and woody vegetation out in the grasslands was really important in determining um, where bees were spending their time. So again, if your nest is, your nesting is in wood and you're too far away, you know, 400 meters from, from a piece of wood, you're not going to be flying back and forth all that distance, right? So I, what I hypothesized was that they, uh, the nesting habitat was just inadequate on these reclaimed lines just because they were mostly grasslands. I started a new study to investigate that. This is another picture of the wilds, uh, another aerial image. My original field study was take, took place in about a square kilometer down here. And now you can see that my sites are distributed across all 10,000 acres. And I was interested in looking at woody uh, nesting habitat, things like uh, stems, plants, uh, grass stems, and this is a, an old dry stump, fence posts, all of these could be potential habitat, in addition to things like bare ground and rocks and stuff like that. And what I found after two years of investigating the, uh, the, the woody substrates and the bee diversity and all of these sites was that I tended to get more bees in areas that had more different kinds of substrate. So there was some kind of an interaction between the availability of what I consider to be the nesting habitat and the bees that I found at these sites. So again, out in these grasslands, things seem to be limited by bees. Now, I did try some artificial nesting habitat as well. I don't think I included that just because the answer is a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, crazier, <laughs> a little bit harder to explain briefly. Um, I'm going to transition now to a totally different study to give you a, a, a sort of a variety of kind of things that I do. Um, I said that pesticides are extremely important in um, influencing bee populations. And I've gotten the chance to work with a couple of teams of scientists that conduct research on um, crops and pesticides. And in one of these crops, uh, one of these uh, teams, uh, this was a group of researchers centered in Indiana. Um, so uh, they were studying uh, melons and they wanted a couple of other scientists working on related crops. So these are what we call the cucurbits, the cucumbers, melons, and I work on pumpkins here in Ohio. And again, I, I really like pumpkin pollinators. I thought this would be a, a, good, a good mix. We don't grow a lot of commercial cucumbers here in Ohio, uh, nor a lot of commercial melons, but we do have a fair number of commercial pumpkin patches. So we are, uh, we're really interested in how the use of pesticides and, um, and pollinators are sort of interacting across these fields. And so we went out and we examined, um, we examined the pollination and uh, how many bees were on the flowers of these fields. And then we gathered a whole bunch of plant tissue, including nectar, pollen, flowers, leaves, and soil and we tested them all for a wide range of pesticides. And that's a very expensive because it's, it, you have to send these out to big labs and it takes a lot of money. So the only way to do this is to have a ton of money and, uh, and a lot of patience. And this is really important because these crops have some serious pests. The cucumber beetles, the striped and spotted cucumber beetles will attack all the plants in the cucurbitaceae in this family. And not only do they do damage to the plants by um, chewing on the flowers and the leaves and the fruits, but they can transfer viruses from their gut tissues to the plant and those can kill the plants. And so farmers are really stressed about, um, about this, these virus diseases that are attacking the plants. And one of the common uh, pesticides that they use are neonicotinoids. And these are 
supposed to be very safe for vertebrates. That's why farmers like them. However, we understanding now that they are not that safe for bees. Um, and we're also really interested in how, you know, how they were knocking back the pests and whether we could make particular recommendations about, about how to implement pesticides on plants um, where you really needed to control cucumber beetles, but uh, also wanted to protect your pollinators. So our key findings here were that um, insecticides and also fungicides, which we tested for, were at hazardous levels at most of these fields, especially up here in Michigan, where they prophylactically uh, were blasting things with pesticides. They didn't even find cucumber beetles up there because there's so many pesticides in soil, but they also didn't find a lot of pollinators other than honeybees. Um, we also found that uh, wild bee visits uh, declined in areas where uh, you were using a lot of pesticides, right? So if the pesticide level was high, you also didn't get very many bees. But the really key thing that we found was there was an even bigger effect if you were using pesticides locally and you were, there were pesticides being used in your region. And you would have an even bigger impact on the wild bees that they would just really um, decline in visitations. So what this means is it's gonna be very hard for farmers individually to implement um, pollinator conservation measures on their own farms if areas around them are also using pesticides. And that, that's, I think, a very significant finding. And I spared you the graphs on that. <laughs> I wanna talk a little bit about um, what I've been doing right in Ohio, just um, some very basic research to document what bees we have here so that we understand um, where we need to go in terms of conservation. And this all started um, a number of years ago when the rusty patch bumblebee was listed as federally endangered. And all of a sudden, various entities like the Department of Transportation were very interested in uh, knowing if they had any rusty patch bumblebee nearby. So Ohio does not have any formal bee survey. In the history of Ohio, we've never gone out to document all our bees, which I find amazing for an agricultural state that we haven't bothered to do that. Um, the rusty patch bumblebee is federally endangered and Ohio is, was at least part of its range. So we need to know if it's here and how to conserve its habitat. There are uh, many kinds of habitats in Ohio. We have everything from sort of flat plains and, and grasslands to um, sort of hilly areas to deep ravines, forests. So it's a quite a varied state in terms of habitat. So we expect that there should be a large number of bees. Um, nevertheless, when you look at the checklists of bees for neighboring states, they have more bees than we do. That, you know, there are various surveys that have been done on a very small scale in Ohio, and we can kind of add up all those bees onto a checklist, but we're lagging behind Michigan and Pennsylvania and even Indiana. So we feel that there's room to, uh, to expand our knowledge of bees. If we know where rare species occur, um, we can help conserve them. And right now, the rare species really, uh, our knowledge of rare species is really lagging, especially because a lot of the bee work that's been done in Ohio has either been done in agriculture or in urban areas where you're not tending to get most of the rare species. So we started the Ohio Bumblebee Survey. This is a project that was funded uh, by the Department of Transportation. And this is my, my research group. We had a lot of fun with this project. There's Randy, uh, Randy Mitchell, who's at University of Akron, and somewhere in here, uh, Jesse Landerman, who was a, a postdoc who ran this project, Denise Ellsworth, who's at Ohio State, who's an extension person, and a lot of uh, graduate and undergraduate students that were funded on this project. And basically, we asked the question, what bumblebees live in Ohio? And especially, do we have the rusty patch bumblebee? Um, <laughs> and another bumblebee that is declining called the yellow banded bumblebee. It has also been petitioned for endangered species. So we formed the bee team. We um, 
that uh, Denise Ellsworth could help us get the word out. We found research sites all over Ohio where people, uh, regular citizens were willing to have us come onto their land and survey for bees. We got permits for all the state and wildlife areas, the state parks, the metro parks. And over two years, we visited over 300 sites and did hour and a half long surveys there. And we wanted to know not only what bumblebees we have, whether we have rare ones, we wanted to know their relative abundances, we wanted to know um, what the geographic distribution of those bees were so that we would understand better what their habitat is. And at the end of this survey, so this was 2017 and 2018, we ended up with a bunch of maps that look kind of like this. This is for the um, the half black bumblebee. How many of you have heard of the half black one? Yeah, so nobody's heard of this one. It's, it, it occurs around here. You might have seen it. It's kind of smallish. It likes forests and it tends to cluster around these sort of forested areas. You don't get so many of them up in, in the, the western part of the state. Um, and this is a very useful map. We were able to do this at the species level for all of the bee species that we found in Ohio, which I think is a pretty good contribution. We were also able to apply some analyses to understand a little bit better what kind of habitat these bees were most abundant in. So you can see for this, uh, and it's a kind of crazy graphs, um, but I'll walk you through it. These are the common bees, so the common eastern bumblebee, the, um, the uh, brown belted and the two spot bumblebee, and then there's our half black bumblebee. And what these diagrams show is if the, um, if the line that represents that bee hits the outside, that means they reach their maximum abundance in that habitat. So for these common bees, you can see that several of them reach maximum abundance in planted hay fields, quite close in planted urban areas, and quite close in planted roadsides for a couple of them. But these shapes are all a little bit different, which means each species is doing something a little bit different. And if you apply that to the rarer species, you can see that that's even more different, right? So some of them are very much centered on planted habitats, and some of them are very much centered on urban habitats. And this is important information if we want to go out, find them, and protect those habitats. The other thing we were able to do with these is to understand how, how forest uh, um, and landscape features influence the abundance. And so this shows you that different bee species respond differently to forested landscapes. Some of them really like to be out in the open, like um, the American bumblebee, Pentamonicus here, and, and the uh, yellow and gold bumblebee. But other ones like the half black bumblebee is very happy. It, it's very likely to be found close to forests and uh, in very forested areas. So these again, help us to understand how those bees are using habitat at a species level. And we think that a lot of this has to do with nesting habitat. This is a, a picture that we took of a nest that we found. Um, um, this one is of Bombus oricomus, the um, yellow and gold bumblebee. It nests in grasslands. You can see all the grass here around it. You're not gonna find this nesting in forest. So we need grass and prairies to be able to promote this species. Um, part of this survey was looking at nesting habitats of bumblebees. We wanted to know where they all nest. And so we went out early in the spring and sent out lots of volunteers and lots of students to just wander through natural areas. And we would look for queen bumblebees, which are the only bumblebees out at this time of year, flying low to the ground, searching for nests. And we figured they wouldn't be searching in places that they wouldn't want to nest. That was our assumption. No, this might possibly work as a video embedded in here. This should be a video showing you. Well, after observing a lot of queen bumblebees, uh, what we were able to say is that for at least the common species, you know, they have some similar nesting habitat preferences, but there are little differences, right? So herbaceous litter is more preferred by Bombus griseopolis. 
Um, Bama's about the bimaculatus is really interesting for a splitter. Um, and uh, some of them even are nesting in things like uh, near ponds and near, uh, near grasses. Um, we were also able to um, indicate where, uh, what kind of habitat they were nesting in at a, at a broader scale. So maintained lawns seem to be um, a fair number of the observations we saw, wood uh, edges of uh, field and forest and woods and so forth. So again, what we feel like we're doing is we're getting a little bit closer to understanding um, the actual habitat requirements of the species level. Now, these are just bumblebees. Bumblebees is one genus of a group of bees where we expect to have 500, uh, or where we expect to have many, many more species. So we found in Ohio nine species of bumblebees. Um, that's pretty far from the 500. So we embarked after we finished this project, I wrote another grant and got funded to do the native bee survey of Ohio, including all bees. And this project is ongoing. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about it because it, it's been an interesting project. We started uh, last summer in 2020 during the pandemic, but this was a project that was very well organized by my research associate, um, Alisa Spring. She got together little kits that had uh, passive traps in them and sent them out to hundreds of volunteers all over the state. She tried to get at least one for her county and was very close. Um, and she had them sample bees in these passive traps every single week. It's just a little water bowl trap, it's very safe. Anybody can do it. And we're pretty sure they were deployed in a very consistent way across all of our volunteers. And these uh, samples started coming in at the end of the summer and we realized that these um, these parties that we were going to have where everybody gets to pin up their own specimens to make nice little collections were not going to happen because of the pandemic. And we had to hire a bunch of students to do this over the summer. They pinned 53,000 specimens of bees, 53,000 specimens. So these are all in my lab now. And we're at, they're all, they're all looking like this. It's beautiful. They're pinned, they are labeled mostly sitting in pizza boxes because that's the cheapest thing that we could find to put them in. And um, Malisa is now uh, sort of organizing the identification of these. So she's got us all doing little bits of that. She's even training undergraduate, you know, undergraduate students in their freshman and sophomore year to specialize on particular genera that are too hard to, to ID. And they'll, they'll take on a little project and learn those and, and help us out with databasing them all. So we hope to be able to do some of the things that we did with the bumblebees, but now with all of the bees. I'm almost done here. And I just wanted to say that this has been a, a pleasure to work on, partly because we just got a new lab this past year. So this summer we moved into this pristine new space in the Alfred Center, which was funded very much by local donors um, to the Newark campus. And these are some of my summer students working. There's Malisa Spring peeking under the lab bench there. And they're all pinning and sorting bees. Um, so without the, the hard work of these folks and all of the volunteers that collected the bees, this project would not have taken off. And we've got another year and a half to get these all identified and, and uh, written up. So hopefully we can be able to do that. The last thing I wanna say is Community science, the contributions of community scientists cannot be overlooked. Um, not only did they help us a lot with um, our various surveys and have participated by letting us use their land, back in 2017, when we started doing these surveys, um, I was in on a meeting of other uh, conservation scientists in Ohio, where we decided what we needed was a, um, a, a project on this website called iNaturalist. Um, which is, you can think of it as Facebook for nature nerds. It's where you can post your nature pictures and other people will identify them. It's all crowdsourced. And we started a, a project called the Ohio Bee Atlas and started uh, promoting it, getting people to join. We now have um, over 400 and uh, 4,300 contributors, so different individuals that are posting pictures of bees on there. 
Um, we have over 35,000 observations of bees in Ohio and um, 191 species. So this project in just a couple of years has really taken off. Uh, we have a lot of experts that go in there and identify the pictures. And it's been good. We've got you know, some species, not 500 yet, but we're, we're working on it. Um, but just last week, somebody posted this picture. This is the yellow banded bumblebee, which apparently exists in Ohio. We didn't find it in two years and 318 sites. Somebody posted, one of these uh, community scientists posted this picture a couple of weeks ago uh, from her yard uh, near Cleveland. So we know that this bee uh, now occurs in Ohio. So that's a really a big contribution. Okay, so uh, with that, I'm just gonna end if uh, anybody has questions. I'd like to acknowledge um, a couple of people. Uh, Dr. Jesse Lantham in the botany was a graduate student and a postdoc in my lab and ran the bumblebee survey and has done a lot of work on publishing, a uh, very organized uh, woman. Uh, Dr. Randall Mitchell, Mitchell and his uh, master's student, Paige Rear, were instrumental in the Bumblebee survey. Um, Dr. James Hung and Ian Kaplan were two of the scientists I worked with on the pesticide project. James Hung just started a, a faculty position at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, many, many other graduate, graduate students. And I, I did leave Malisa Spring off here because this is an old slide but she is the coordinator of the Ohio, um, uh, Ohio Bee Survey. And these are some of our, our funding agencies. So thank you very much for your attention. You know, you look at them, as you say, you look at it, bee, most people think it's a honey bee, <laughs> and we're shipping away 500. Uh, so thank you. Question. Yes. So